Actor and writer Chaz Palmiteri has three conditions, had three conditions, when Hollywood Studios were scrambling to option his one-man play, A Bronx Tale. He wanted to write the script, he wanted to star in the film, and he wanted to keep his original executive producer. Hollywood said no thanks, but Robert De Niro said yes. He wanted to make this story about a Bronx neighborhood in the 60s, his long-awaited directorial debut. With a Bronx tale set to open later this week, both Palminteri and De Niro are winning critical cheers, not Bronx ones, and we're pleased to have Chaz Palminteri here to talk about this uh, film, Bronx Tale. Welcome. It's great Hi. to have you on the show. Thanks very much, Sean. Uh, you, you st Los Angeles and New York are still home, and you still go back to the Bronx to, to keep yeah, the friendships sure. with the... I still have my friends back there. I go yeah. back. In fact, some of the guys that are in the movie are, are from that neighborhood that still yeah. go there. Yeah, I want to talk about that. This is okay. from Newsweek, which is just out uh, uh, this morning. It said, A Bronx Tale is a deliciously well-observed memory piece about growing up in the 60s that marks the vital debut of director Robert De Niro. Sure, there are echoes of Scorsese, but a De Niro and writer Chaz Palminteri put a fresh spin on the story of a young boy growing up torn between two patriarchs, his real dad, played by De Niro, a hardworking bus driver who wants to save his son from the temptations of the street and the suave local crime boss, Sonny, who is played by you. This yes. is from Newsweek, uh, and I suspect you'll get a lot of other rave reviews. Tell me about the story of Bronx Tale and where it came from in your head and why you decided uh, to first put it on stage, right. and it made its way to film. Right. Well, I was a young boy. Obviously, I was. I used to. Uh, you know. Let, let me just say, it's not an autobiographical tale. It's. A, it's um, a fictionalized story based on some true incidences. One is, I was a young boy sitting on my stoop in the Bronx, and I used to hang out there. And all the wise guys were always on the corner, and I would watch them. And one day, these two cars were like trying to park in a parking space, and one guy got out with a baseball bat, smashed the window, and the other guy shot him. And then he, he shot, and as he fell, he kind of like turned, and he stared right at me, and I stared at him. And it was like, when you know, you just kind of freeze, and I just looked at him, and he looked at me. And then the next minute, I knew my father grabbed me by my arm and like pulled me upstairs. And it was something that I just kind of never forgot. I never forgot the face, the way he looked, the way everything turned into slow motion at the time. And then I just forgot about it. And as, year, but as years went on, I kept thinking about it. Then it was gone here and there, I would think about it. Then that cut to, I'm an actor. I'm an actor in, uh, uh, you know, for years, and I did a lot of theater in, LA, in, in New York for yeah. about five or six years. Then I'm in L.A. In 86, you go to L.A. To 86, I go to L.A. It's 1988. Two years later, I'm doing some roles, guest star roles, and I still can't get that great role. Finally, I'm, I'm supplementing my income as a doorman at some nightclub in L.A. I get fired. The guy fires me. I come home. I'm dejected. I got about 200 in the bank. The rent's due. I don't know what to do. Not 200000 no, $200, <laughs> yes. $200 in the bank. The rent's due. I'm living in some dump in North Hollywood. And finally, I said to myself, you know, I cannot do this. I cannot wait for a great role. And my father always used to tell me, the saddest thing in life is wasted talent. Always, when, he was, when I was a little kid, he put a little card in my room and said, don't forget that. And it's kind of stayed in my head. And I said, I got to do something. I went to a thrifty drugstore. I got some yellow tabs of paper. And I said, what could I write about? Then I thought about that incident that's been in my mind. So I just wrote the first five minutes. It started as a five-minute monologue. I put it up in my acting class. Everybody was like, wow, you know, like really blown away by it. So I said, wow, this is really good. So during the week, I wrote as much as I can. And on Monday night, I would perform it in front of a live audience. And I would add it to 15 minutes. I would take five. I would take three. And this went on for almost a year. At the end of the year, I had an hour and a half show. Uh, Basically, and I did all the characters alone. It wasn't like a one-man show, per se. I played all the parts. I actually did the whole movie on stage alone. So it was like the ultimate pitch, and it was like the ultimate audition for an actor. So it was great. Yeah, and then you got great reviews in Los Angeles. Right, I got great reviews People in Los Angeles. People came to you and said this would make a film? Or oh, no, they said, no, as soon as the, the day the reviews came out, my life changed. I mean, I was besieged by every producer, director, studio head, agent in Hollywood. Here I was getting calls from like people. Like, let's have dinner. Let's have dinner. Let's have dinner. What are you doing? What am I doing? What happened last week? You know, I mean, right. come on. How come you didn't call me last yeah, exactly. week? You know, now I'm What's your, different about me? Right. I'm your friend now? <laughs> you know, all of a sudden we're like friends, you yeah. know. But I understand that. That's the business. So finally, I mean, they wanted the property of the studios. They said, look, you're terrific in it, but we can't make a 20-something million dollar movie with, with you. you. With you. Right. Who are you? You know, you put your name on a marquee, you couldn't fill up an elevator. That's what basically they were saying to me, you know. So, now, did uh, this tear at your ego, or do you know you had the no, entree, it, it, you were holding all the right. aces? It did not tear my ego. I, I understood that. I have no animosity right. towards any of the studios for that, right. because 
if I was in their position, I probably would do the same thing, want to put a, a major star in it. But I had the goods. Yeah. They couldn't do anything. Yeah. I said, no deal. Forget it. No deal. But in Hollywood, when you say no, they think it means Maybe. more money. <laughs> oh, I see. see though, they, so they kept... No means pay me more. Pay me more. So they kept offering more and more and more. It was six figures, and I still said no. Then finally, before I came to New York, they hit seven figures yeah. for me to walk away from the project. We're talking millions. We're talking, yes, over a million dollars. Right. And I got up from the table. I was with my agents, and um, I said no. I said, am I in it? They said, we'll do, what was their words? Well, we'll do best efforts. <laughs> which means I wouldn't trust that right. for a second. Exactly, would you? which means <laughs> no place for no, jazz. This means we're, we're saying something nice, but we're really gonna you're gonna be out of here. Yeah, that's right. So I said, forget it. It's yeah. just not gonna happen. It's got to be in the contract. And they said they couldn't do it. So I walked. Yeah. And they said, well, if it goes to New York and it bombs, this might not be here when you get back. So I said, well, yeah. what about and if it's a big hit? Yeah. And uh, okay, but a couple of things here. Yeah. Uh, De Niro had been in to see it. Yes, Bob in saw it in L.A. In Los Angeles, he loved it. He, he, he said, listen, you'll be terrific in it, you know. And we kept talking, you know, we kept having meetings, him and I. Then he saw it again in New York. Yeah. And he said to me, look, you'll be great as Sonny. You'll write the screenplay and nobody else. You know, your Peter Gation will be the executive producer. I want to direct it. Let's do it. And, he says, and, he'll, and I'll protect and you. And had he been looking, did he say to you, I've been looking for the right project right. that I can direct? And this is a story that I want to direct. Bob said he told me he was he's been looking for years to direct, and but he said this was a perfect story. He knew the element, and it was a role that he could play in it that was a good role, but he didn't have to carry the movie. And he went out to see your father so he'd understand. Who right, he called. He sent my father up. He sent my father a ticket from Florida. My father flew up, and uh, he met with him, and they kept meeting. It was great. Was Sylvester Stallone's story in the back of your mind? Because it, there, clearly there is right. the same idea exactly. when he wrote um, uh, Rocky. Uh, Rocky. Right. He said, I'm not going to sell to anybody unless they let me star in it. Right. Was uh, well, that there in the back of your mind? I mean, I thought about it. I said, well, it's been done already. Somebody did it. Sly did it. In fact, when I met Sly, I did a movie with him, and I met with him, and I talked to him about it, and he was very gracious. He said, well, good luck to you. I hope, you know, hope it works out. And it, and it worked out good. And De Niro said, I accept all your conditions. It will work. I'll Absolutely. direct, you know. Yeah. What, um, did you have a sense when you were making it that it was going to be what, because of De Niro, because of the relationship, because of the way it was going, because you went out and hired authentic right. characters to right. play the role? Right. I just, you know, I had many talks with Bob, uh, and he just knew, he, I, I, there was a vision of the movie that I had, Charlie, and, and he had the same vision, he had this vision, and he looked at me, and he said to me, when all these big directors wanted to do it, he said, look, you know, because Bob never directed before, so a lot of people were saying, well, don't use De Niro, he's never directed, get an established director. But I met with him, and he looked at me, and I don't know if you ever met Bob, but he looks in the eyes, mm -hmm. and he said, look, you can go who, whatever you want to go with. I don't care. If you don't want to, fine. He goes, but let me tell you something. If you make it with me, I'll make it right. And he looked me in the eyes, and I just, you know, it's like, you know. I said, this guy will make a great movie. I knew it. I just felt it inside of me. I was right. He made a great movie. Uh, yeah. Tell me about De Niro as an actor and as a director and, and what you think his genius is. You know, I was watching one of your shows once and you were talking to an actor about Bob, you know, and I was right. saying, gee, I wish I was on there to tell Charlie <laughs> what I feel about Bob, you know. And, uh, so here we are. And here I am, you know. So I said, I can't wait to get on there because I, I don't remember who it was and they were very gracious. And, but. Uh, but I've been with Bob for three years, and you know, who it was it was probably Richard Dreyfus. It was Richard Dreyfus. Richard That's Dreyfus it, right, yeah. exactly right. And Richard said some wonderful things. How Bob can just kind of like take his body away and be somebody else, and he was absolutely correct in that. But what my take on Bob is what makes him so great is that Bob has like a co he has two things especially. One, God has given him something that he doesn't give everybody. That's number one. And two, Bob just works harder than anybody else. I mean, anybody else. I mean, I'm a, I'm a workaholic, yeah. but I had to keep up with him. The man will burn anyone out. He, it's just like amazing. I've never seen anything like it. And he could concentrate harder than anybody I've ever seen. I'm telling you, Charlie, he just takes it to and like, he's here, and like, and everybody's like A here. whole other zone. It, it's like, you know, when Michael Jordan yeah. starts getting into that thing, right. and, and all right. of a sudden he can't miss. Yeah. It's like Bob, it's like you go, okay. But then like Scottie Pippen is better because of him. Yeah. So Bob made me better. It's like we kind of just complimented each other. Because he pulled you up into right. He just his sweeps you up. His own for passion for the product. Right. Exactly. He just sweeps you up into it. He's, he has such a force about him that just sweeps you up. 
It's, it's amazing to feel, I'm telling you. It's like he's gifted. He's got, he's, he's got, a, he's got a gift, and he works hard. Like any, like, it's like having Mickey Mantle with great legs. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Do you know what and I mean? And good health. And good Mickey health. Mickey Mantle and good health. Right. They always said if Mickey Mantle had great legs, yeah. you would hit 900 homers. Right, well, right, that's right. Bob. <laughs> it's Mickey Mantle, and he's got great he's legs. He's got great legs, too. He's got everything. Yeah. Right. How is he as a director, though? What does he give you as a director? Well, he approaches directing like he approaches acting, the same way. He's very meticulous. He's very, you know, very sure. He just, he's very good. He, being such a great actor, he's, he's kind to the actors. He whispers in your ear. He doesn't talk loud in front of a lot of people. He might just tell me certain things say less, more, you know, he just kind of guides you. And, you, and you, I trust him, you know, so I said, okay, and I'm very happy with my performance. I mean, what a great feeling to be directed by one of the great actors. You now, know? you are now starring in an untitled, getting ready, you may be shooting it now, I don't know where it stands. Wednesday Woody starts. Allen. You start principal photography, as they say. What, Wednesday, Wednesday, in Woody Allen's movie, Woody, yes. Uh, does it have a title yet? No. Okay. And, no. and you're co-starring with, or you're starring uh, with? Uh, John Cusack, Diane Weiss, Jennifer Tilly. Jack Warden, Alan Arkin, Carl Reiner, Rob Reiner. Wow. It's and how thing. did that come about? Uh, because that happened before this was out. He hadn't seen this. Right. No, Woody and didn't, didn't see it. Julia Taylor, who knows me, called me in to meet Woody. I met with Woody. I read for him, and I got the part. That now, would it. that have happened without the Bronx Tale? I mean, he must have seen, somebody must have talked to him about you. I mean, it, because uh, you didn't have a whole long list of no, major no, film credits. No, uh, but Julia Taylor knew me, I guess, from right. doing a lot of theater in New York. And uh, she called me in. She said, I, uh, and she told Woody, I think he'd be right for this. And yeah. he liked me a lot. One other thing from the film, which I find so true. Your fa the father tells the son, tough guys. No, how does it go? The tough, right. go ahead. He says to the father, he says, uh, uh, you, think it take much strength, you think it takes much strength to pull the trigger? He says, but try to get up every day in the morning and work for a living. And then we see who the tough guy is. He goes, the working yeah. man's the tough yeah. guy. The other thing you make a point, there are a lot of people in the Bronx who get up every day and go to work in jobs right. they don't like. You and I love our work. Right. Who don't, but, but they do it because of the love of their family. That's right. They and just want their children's lives to be better. That's all they want. No dreams, no nothing. And these are the people that, that I'm, I like to write about. Your dad must be proud of you. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for joining us this evening. We'll see you again tomorrow night right here from the same place. See you then.